And uh, we learned some very exciting developments yesterday at the local station board meeting. It was brought up, uh, and Tom Voorhees uh, is going to talk about it later. And that is that through digital technology, um, we can get a digital transmitter at KPFA that would change from an analog transmitter, which we presently have, to digital, which would allow two new channels uh, on, on KPFA. And the reason that's important is not only it allows additional voices, uh, but there's a lot of programming that needs to be brought into KPFA, which has been excluded, which has been prevented from being there. We have to get young voices on, and we have to be able to do that to open spaces. And actually, uh, it would cost $60,000, but it would be a whole new channel. And I think one of the issues that that raises is the fight for more Spanish programming. California has a large percentage of Latino Spanish-speaking population. KPFA and Pacifica need to have voices directly to the population, the Spanish-speaking population. And that is critical if we're going to have a hearing among the mass of people in this country. In Los Angeles, uh, for example, there are a million Iranian Americans. No Iranian programming on KPFK. Uh, there are uh, 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 large minority communities, a million Koreans. Korean Americans in Los Angeles, no Korean programming. We have to reach out and broaden our programming. And I think that uh, the national board has passed a motion called for Spanish programming, and people are fighting for that. And one of the issues is uh, keeping the Spanish programming and developing it. And so there's opportunities to expand it. Uh, Pedro Reyes, who's our next speaker, uh, has been a long-term programmer at KPFA and fought for Spanish-speaking programming and also had a struggle to get notification from the management about changes that were brought in unilaterally without the staff being notified. So welcome, Pedro Reyes. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, talking about Spanish radio, expanding our, you know, language to that ability to who's the majority here really does help. Uh, you know, we've been, I've been a part of uh, KPFA for 20 years now. I uh, started in 1999, I think, it's uh, 2018, so almost 20 years, yeah. So basically, uh, you know, starting out in La Onda Bajita, which does a Chicano program uh, and focuses on native issues, immigrant rights issues, and uh, people of color issues, basically, right, and low income. Uh, and basically seeing the fact that there was no Spanish programming, 1999 come around, Right, we, we, I started to think with Gavilan, hey Gavilan, you know what, there's no Spanish programming, what's up? You know, how come KPFA don't have no Spanish programming? And we decided, hey, you know what, why don't we do the first uh, Friday of the month, we'll do all Spanish programming. So what we did was we turned that first Friday into Spanish programming. Ended up, uh, now we've been doing Spanish programming for that first Friday for over for 20 years now, you know? So basically, uh, now we hold down that information about Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Centro America, Sur America, right? And we talk about all those politics that are going on down there that are not really well known through other sources of, you know, information that are actually on KPFA in that sense of, living that experience of being in the war, living in that sense of being poor, right? Living in that experience of having to uh, migrate and be forced to migrate by U.S. foreign policies, right? And unfortunately, uh, what happens is that we start to notice the fact that, you know, even the majority starts to develop here in California, we still don't have Spanish programming on Pacifica, I'm sorry, KPFA, right? The majority of programming we have on, on Pacifica, on KPFA is basically English programming. You know, I started to investigate, because I, I do some investigating sometimes, and you know, <laughs> next thing you know, I play it on the radio, right? Uh, so basically, I started to investigate and was checking out these fun drives and seeing, okay, well, you know, we get about $1,000 in on a Friday night, right? 
and we talk Spanish. And so I go to other people, how much do you guys? Oh, 700, 600, 500, sometimes 200. And they talk English, right? And I go, see, I think that tells us something that the dollar doesn't only speak English, right? The dollar is multicultural, speaks many languages. But here in KPFA, we only speak English 99, 95% of the time, right? That's all week long, right? Till you get to Friday night, and then maybe Sunday, one hour of Spanish broken rebellion, but doesn't really focus on the issues, right? So again, the idea is that I've been a volunteer for 20 years and still fighting to bring in Spanish programming. Suddenly we get a mandate from Pacifica saying, hey, there's a lot of raza in Califas, and we need them to be able to understand some of the information that's not being spoken about in Spanish. So to this day, we're still waiting. Where's the Spanish news programming that we were promised? That was mandated, whatever that means, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, that funding never came. That funding, there was talks about having Spanish news programming and that there would be funding. Suddenly all the funding was not there no more, right? Oh wait, but this other English program gets another hour and this other program gets moved to the 5 a.m. hour. That also gets paid at KPFK. I mean, who are you trying to fool, right? So the idea is, again, now they went and cut volunteer programming again. At, just like Frank was mentioning, the morning mix was cut five days in a row, right? One hour of volunteer programming every day cuts the cost down, right? They come to my show, three times they try to move me. They say, hey, you gotta go somewhere else. You gotta do another time slot. I'm like, what? what? When did this happen? How did you guys decide this? I, I was never told. Oh yeah, you're taking over a bachelor's pl place on Tuesday nights from eight to 10. What's the big deal? And then Avacha is going to be doing your show Wednesday, Wednesday early mornings from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Like you realize she's 80 years old and that she's on a roller, that she drives a handicap van, that she's barely able to walk into the building sometimes, right? What happens? Oh, no, that's not... You don't have no say in that. Who cares what you have to say? I'm like, really? You're gonna, you're gonna make me move an elder into a night shift, graveyard shift, and have me in an eight to 10 slot, comfortably you know, coming in on a nice time, Tuesday night? I'm like, that doesn't make no sense, right? Of course, they didn't ask us for any input. Of course, they didn't give us any warning. And of course, they just went ahead and tried to force us to do it. They said, next week, you guys are doing it. If you don't do it, you guys are out, or whatever the consequence might have been. So, you know, I started talking to some volunteers and being like, hey, what's going on? How come they want Avacha to do 1 o'clock in the morning? And all the homies and homegirls said, no, nah, you know what? That's not cool. They're not going to move Avacha. She's been doing that. She's the teacher. She's the maestra. You don't go and move the maestra. I'm like, hey, I'm not trying to. And I'm not going to either. You know, they can say whatever, but I'm not gonna do it. Right, so we went and we fought that. UPSO got together and finally figured out, hey, this guy's right. You know, there's too much, there's too much movement going on. We, we just can't stop them from not doing what we, what we, we can't stop them from doing what we want, right? And basically, he came down. To, that was the first time. Second time, hey, you're moving again. Oh, whoa, why, why am I moving again, you know? Like, it's, it's the early slots, right? All of a sudden, traffic has gotten more congested. So now, traffic starts at 4 a.m., so you don't have, you, you're out. I'm like, whoa, really? I, 
I, I knew that. I mean, I get out at five, six in the morning, I'm already stuck in traffic going back to the city, right? After doing a late night show, five hours, right? One in the morning till six in the morning. I've been doing that show since about 10 years now, right? All of a sudden, right? Boom. We, we were gonna cut you an hour and basically you don't have no say again, right? It's like, okay, well, this is now the third time this is happening to me where they don't tell me, they don't actually give me any type of notification and they expect me to do something from one week to the next. Now, I'm going like, but how does this make sense? We're in a financial crisis last month. This month we're doing great, yay, right? And all of a sudden, people start to separate themselves from Pacifica. Oh, well, Pacifica's doing bad, not KPFA, right? Come on. If Pacifica's doing bad, we know KPFA is doing bad. And all the other radio stations are doing bad, right? So when they make this decision about, hey, we're going to expand this show an hour, we're going to give this other show an Another, uh, we're gonna move this show and take away your hour. And then all the other music shows that go during the week too, not just me, right? It was also Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, except for Friday, right? And so the idea is that again, what happened there? They took five hours of volunteer time. Now they're paying three different shows, spending three times the money versus three times less. Right? Management. Quincy. Right? And so I go to the Nellis board be meeting, try to get some information, try to see what's going on. I wait three hours to speak three minutes. Yeah, I waste my time. I figure it out. You know, somehow I just text the people, hang out there, you know, made that time. Because my voice is important somehow, somewhere, maybe to somebody, right? So I figured maybe somebody will listen to me. Nope, nothing happened after that. I'm still, my hour's been cut. All of our music programs during the week, Monday through Thursday, have been cut, right? All the way up till five in the morning, then you get Sonali, which is, again, a, you know, a syndicated show that's paid in KPFK, right? They tell me, oh no, we don't pay, we don't pay Sonali. I'm like, come on, you're Pacifica. You're not, you, you got it for somebody's got to pay her. She's not doing that for free, right? I'm doing that for free. You know, I'm doing 10 hours of volunteer for free for Pacifica, for KPFA. I don't separate myself from Pacifica. That's 10 hours I give to Pacifica every week. One in the morning to five in the morning for 10, 15 years. Now, they also said, you don't do public affairs. I'm sorry, what? I save my public affairs for five in the morning till six in the morning because I know there's traffic. I'm sorry you just found out. I have to deal with traffic every time I go back to San Francisco, being awake all night, early in the morning to be there for my kids to take them to school, right? But that don't matter to management. They didn't come up to me and said, hey, you know what? Uh, we we want to hear more public affairs. How can we work with you? How can we be able to get you to do some more interviews in Spanish and English? You know, there's a lot of raza out there getting up at five in the morning, going to go do janitor work or just stalking or whatever, you know, right? It's like, no, they just said, you're out. We, we got a pre-recorded program. We can play any time and we chose your time. I'm like, wow, really? Okay, well, you know, that's kind of what I see now, part of the problem that when we separate KPFA from Pacifica, we begin to lose that understanding that we're under this bigger umbrella. Whether we volunteer there or we are paid, if Pacifica's not doing well, then KPFA and other radio stations are also gonna go down. So when I say, you know what, I, I, I'll, I'll cover somebody's show because they're sick, 
because they can't make it because they've been there so long that, you know, their body starts to hurt. They don't catch any sleep. They don't get to rest. When they need a vacation, hey, I'll cover your show. Yeah, take some rest, you know, so that people can be able to, but they don't pay me, right? I do it on a voluntary basis, right? And so what I've been doing with KPFA is also been going on the field. I've been streaming on the field. I've been a mobile broadcaster on the field. Not once have I gotten paid for that. It's all volunteer. But management has never come to me and said, hey, you know what? I think you got something here. Maybe you could start out in a, you know, training some of the folks here to go out into the field. And that's when we brought in Frank. Frank knows that I go out into the field. I go to Alcatraz at 5 in the morning, set up a radio station that's going to transmit to KPFA. I've gone to marches where we broadcast from the back of the stage, live on the street, direct. We hook up ISDN lines, we do wireless, we do whatever it takes to get that signal off the ground from the street at that moment when it's needed. And not once has management come, has management come up to me and give me a shake. Not once. I've gone through three managers. Maybe four of this, you never know, right? <laughs> and none of them, not even one, has come up to me and said, oh man, we really appreciate that anti-war protest you, you guys had on last week. No, they go to the host, right? Yeah. They don't come to me. Oh, Dennis, you did a great job. Oh, you know, Gavilan, or you know, da 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 da. But they don't know I'm the one that's also in the field. Right? They don't bother to even ask me. Now, as part of being in the field, we also did mobile broadcasting. Some people might remember New College, right? In San Francisco, we did broadcasting from out there. We set up a whole setup where we had almost like a uh, satellite studio, put it that way. We started out with just a room like this, little chairs, a dirty carpet and a table. It was called the Creamery. I don't know, you might remember it. It's on 19th and Valencia, right? And what we did there, right? We started working with college students, teaching them about journalism, how to get involved with KPFA, how to give them access to KPFA as journalists, right? And we also developed programming that was focused around Raza and the Barrio, that was focusing on talking about issues in the mission that was talking about gentrification, that was talking about gang warfare, that was talking about police brutality, that was talking about all the different issues that San Francisco focuses on and bringing in those organizers right there in the mission, from the mission, right? And so what we did was we also brought in bands. We brought musicians. We, we made it to the point where we had musicians being broadcasted on the radio, on the internet, and at the same time we had multiple buildings where we could have a band here and then in the other building we could also be on another channel on the mixer where we had the host. I was able to do all this just because I was experimenting with sound. I love sound and I love finding ways to liberate sound. I'm a part of the micro radio movement, so I come from Santa Cruz, pre-pirate radio, pre-radio Santa Cruz, right? I did pirate radio for six years. That radio station got busted three times by the FCC and it still continues to make a point of fighting to be able to be on the airwaves to this day, right? So when I hear, you know, like people complaining that Hey, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're losing funding, but then no one's really stepping up to volunteer. When our station is going down, a lot of people will say, you know what? I'm just going for whatever happens. But I'm going like, no, man, I come from micro radio. We got the backup already set up across the street. 
We ain't waiting for them to come and take over the building. We're going to start broadcasting as soon as they start to, you know, put up those guards in front of those doors. No, hell no. We ain't going to let the empire strike us down, right? So the idea, again, is to liberate the airwaves, to give access to the airwaves. And as a volunteer, that's what I do. Thank you. That's what I love to do. So again, the reason I do it is because I want my people to have a voice. I want my community to also have access to the airwaves. And I'm one of the few at the station that has been there for so long that can be able to do this. But after 20 years of not seeing someone else of my color come in and be able to have these types of you know, opportunities to open the doors to their communities, right? It makes me sad. It makes me sad that we don't allow that growth, that we don't see that opportunity of these voices who really need the microphone to have access to them and their support for us to be able to continue on the airways. So again, the more Spanish programming we have, right, the more diverse voices we have, like I also like to speak other languages and have people who, other, who speak other languages on the radio. And you know what, if you don't understand it, oh well, yeah. figure it out, you know, because that's their native tongue, and you know, and I appreciate hearing their native tongue. So I think I'm gonna leave it there, but again, the idea is as a volunteer, I did file a harassment complaint to management, never got it, never heard back from them. I also filed a harassment complaint to Pacifica, never heard back from them. They said, hey, it's okay, it's just you, it's just, it's just an hour, don't worry about it, get some sleep, you know? Really? Uh, okay, well, I'll figure it out, right? And so basically, to this day, I have not heard from anybody back about these, you know, harassment complaints that I've made. And unfortunately, that's how volunteers are treated at KPFA. We don't matter. Not, e not even the LSB. And I'm sorry to say, but, you know, I went to the LSB, right? I went through the whole process. What is the process for filing a complaint by a volunteer? I go to Richard Withers, who also took me off the air in KFCF. He says, hey man, you fell asleep one time. I'm like, bro, that's like the first time in 20 years. <laughs> no, 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 yo, you keep waking me up and blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I, I had to figure it out. I'm like, you know, I apologize to him. I said, hey, I'm sorry if, if this was actually, you know, a problem that happened, but, you know, I really do apologize. I didn't know. I wasn't aware. And all of a sudden, you know, he's like, well, what other shows do you do? I'm like, what? I cover a lot of shows. <laughs> well, I'm going to make sure you're not on KFCF no more. And I'm like, wow, really? Like, just because at one time. I mean, this is white power in that sense of, like, abusing it, so to speak, right? But this is, I, I'd go and look at KFCS website, Save KPFA, Brian Edward Teekers is all, all over that place, right? And other people there too on Save KPFA. No people of color. You're talking about Fresno here, right? Central Valley, who lives there? Really? Save KPFA? I don't know, but, since he took me off the air, now he's going to have to figure out how to fill in 10 hours on his own. And he also threatened to take off La Onda Bajita, which is not in the middle of the night, right? Oh, I'll take off that Chicano program, right? It's like, okay, well, you know, I guess you have a problem with Raza, right? Because all I was trying to say was sorry and hoping that you would put my show back on the air. And unfortunately, he couldn't even handle that. So uh, I'm still stuck on that battle, too. I'm just trying to do radio. That's all, right? So again, uh, I appreciate everybody here. And thank you for you know, supporting KPFA in many different ways. 
And remember that we are not just uh, phone volunteers. We are volunteers that come in every night, every week, right, and do our volunteering on the radio, on the airwaves, versus like phone, phone volunteers just come in once every three months, maybe an hour or two, right? Lucky. And so, <laughs> and so again, we volunteer every week, not just you know, one hour, but at least five, right? So thank you. Thank you, Pedro. And, uh, you know, the, the volunteers are an important part, a critical part of KPFA. They make it run, and Pacifica, as a matter of fact. And one of the things we've been fighting for uh, is a, uh, a a meeting, a town hall meeting, uh, every uh, twice a year, which is in the bylaws. And uh, we've, I made a motion at the last meeting that we have town hall meetings. I, I know that people have to be heard. The supporters of KPFA and Pacifica have to be heard. And you can only do that in a fair way by having democratic meetings where people can come and speak and say what they think about the issues, what programming they want, and what they want to see at KPFA and Pacifica. So I hope the board at the upcoming meeting will actually agree to implement their own bylaws, which says that they have to have a town hall meeting twice a year at minimum. And I think that's something we should require. Uh, decisions are being made without consultation of the members of KPFA, of the people who give money to KPFA. That is wrong, and that has to be changed. Now, we've, uh, and I, I know it's getting on, but we do have our last speaker who uh, is going to talk a bit about the whole issue of uh, governance and bankruptcy. Because frankly, when, when we were told that the station may close its doors, and there had been no discussion, no reports to the listeners. That is unacceptable. That is unacceptable because, frankly, we have to defend KPFA. We have to defend Pacifica. We're not going to allow the doors to be closed at KPFA. And that requires an organization, a movement, to defend the station. So our next speaker is Janet Cobran, who is a just passed... Uh, was on the KPFA local station board and has just been elected National Secretary of Pacifica. Welcome, Janet Coburn. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, being Foundation Secretary is a mixed, mixed blessing. I've received congratulations and condolences. <laughs> After serving, well, I, I, I had served on the KPFA local station board, as Steve had mentioned and I termed out on February 4th, just recently. Let me start by saying that I'm al sorry. although some of you have been involved, very involved in KPFA and Pacifica Matters, others of you are not as familiar with all the ins and outs and the players and uh, the technical terminology. So I'll do my best to ensure that everybody can relate to what I will be addressing. Aside from identifying as an eclectic activist and having been an information technology systems analyst, much of my work in KPFA land has been unpopular. But that's because I ask questions, do research, and go against the grain. I was affiliated for many years with one of the two major KPFA factions, UCR, United for Community Radio, because I agreed with and supported its positions on unpaid staff, program council, and outreach to unrepresented communities. I think very highly of live streaming. I like to watch it because when it's done well, it makes you, it almost makes you feel like you're there um, in person. And uh, I'm so pleased that this is being live streamed. I actually did some live streaming myself. I learned uh, a little bit about it from uh, when I went to a labor tech uh, conference, Steve Zeltzer puts these on. Um, I live streamed at Occupy. Um, so, uh, and I, I have always advocated that KPFA have a live stream channel on its website. 
Uh, there was a, a live stream team, I guess it's not uh, operating anymore, of John Perulis and Steve and Frank and Carol Wolfley. Um, and by the way, when it comes to Spanish language programming, last year the uh, PNB rescinded the motion that mandated Spanish language programming. So that's part of why maybe some of this is happening, what Pedro was talking about. I was never affiliated with Safe KPFA, whose mantra is local control and professional programming. I, I was a KPFA director from 2014 to 2016 and PNB secretary in 2015 and 2016, and so now I'm back. Um, on the national level, the factions are a whole different matter. Up until the middle of last year or so, there had always been two major factions. And when I was new to the PNB neighborhood in 2014, I was led to believe that they were like the two at KPFA. I soon learned that that was not the case, that there were nuances that I had been unaware of, and things were not as black and white as I originally thought. By the way, there seem to be now three factions, two of which joined together against the third on different issues. In early 2014, I was part of the PDGG, Pacifica Directors for Good Governance, uh, which sued Pacifica over Summer Reese's contract controversy. However, once the ju judge ruled against PDGG and Summer had to vacate the national office that she had been occupying 24-7, I realized that continuing to pursue the case, uh, which the remaining PDG directors were doing, would basically be defying a court order. I had had other issues with PDGG, like although they call themselves Indies, my experience was when anyone truly wanted to act independently, they were silenced. But the court ruling was the final straw, so I withdrew from the case and operated all alone for a while on the PNB until some other non-KPFA directors began reaching out to me sent me a number of documents that did not support the narrative I had come into the PNB with. And I began to develop some working relationships with people I had, had a closed mind to, and they in turn began to listen to my story about KPFA. That was very different from the safe KPFA story. When I began to exercise my director's inspections, inspection rights regarding KPFA management practices, when I inspected the personnel files and timesheets, and then when I uncovered the fact that a $400,000 bequest check that had been made out to the Pacifica Foundation had been deposited in KPFA's bank account and not the Pacifica bank account, and brought this to the attention of the PNB, I was attacked by safe K KPFA advocates. This and the KPFA Foundation, which I was instrumental in exposing, caused a rift between the safe KPFA directors and the rest of the faction they were affiliated with. On the other hand, when UCR opposed positions I was taking with regards to the WBAI LSB seating controversy, and the affiliates election, both issues outside of KPFA. I was pressured by them to breach my duty of loyalty to Pacifica, which included abiding by PNB decisions, some of which I did not agree with, and instead give factional positions priority. And so I decided to disaffiliate from UCR in February 2016 and become a, uh, officially independent at that point. You can ask, if there's Q&A, you can ask me more about that. 
But I will say that I was operating as a director based on what the Deputy uh, Attorney General Julianne Mossler told the PNB on December 14, 2017, to wit, quote, as directors on the national board, each of you owes a duty of loyalty to Pacifica to help it achieve these stated purposes. It means that your personal interests and or the interests of your local radio station must take a back seat to Pacifica's interests when you are acting in your capacity on the national board. When your personal interests or those of your local station diverge from Pacifica's interests, Pacifica's interests must always take precedence. As a director on Pacifica's national board, each of you must act in a manner you sincerely believe to be in Pacifica's interests. That means every decision you make must be made for the purpose of advancing Pacifica's interests, even if that means that the interests of your local station or even your personal in interests are adversely affected. To do otherwise constitutes an impermissible conf conflict of interest that can result in your removal from the board, litigation, or even Pacifica's collapse and closure, end quote. So uh, the Pacifica directors are, you know, the, there's different kinds of things that they, ha they have to be responsible to. That brings me to the crisis group which was formed in early 2015 as a so-called cross-factional group. It is a self-selecting lobbying group, in my opinion, that operates in secret, accountable to no one, whose founding members are Eileen Alfandari, Louis Sawyer, Brian Edwards Teekert, Carol Travis, and Margie Wilkinson on the safe KPFA side and Virginia Browning, Susan Da Silva, Peter Frank, Adrian Lobby, Nicole Milner, Sally Summer, and Carol Spooner on the UCR side. The supposed aim is to reduce the tensions between all the national factions by opening up a dialogue between them to find some common ground. They even had a Pacifica Unity Pledge they had people sign onto that said, quote, I am committed to participating in a network-wide consensus building process with the goal of reforming Pacifica's governance to make it simpler, effective, smaller, and calmer. They were unsuccessful in recruiting anyone outside of KPFA, but with five of their members already on the LSB, they did manage to inf infiltrate, in my opinion, the LSB. Carol Travis was already LSB chair. Uh, they recruited new LSB members in 2016, like Sharon Adams, TM Scruggs, Sabrina Jacobs, Bill Campisi, and Tim Lynch, and influenced others to be sympathetic to the point where there is now what I consider to be a crisis group supermajority on the LSB. Their mantra is, be collegial and congenial. But what that looks like in practice is that anyone who is not sympathetic to their agenda and stands up with an independent position, like I do, gets attacked. Congenial and collegial. Anyway, that's how, uh, uh, sorry. What I have seen has been the UCR side cave in to save, save KPFA, save KPFA, the, the new save KPFA, to the point that the two factions are almost indistinguishable now. And I don't see any sign anymore on the LSB or in the station of UCR fighting for what it supposedly stands for. If there were to be a delegate election this year, I have no idea how members would distinguish themselves one slate uh, or another. It is out of this crisis group that several secret LSB retreats were organized and held in 2016 and 2017. 
Six proposals were drafted through the, the crisis group, presented and approved almost unanimously at the November 19th, 2016 LSB meeting, one of which was called Involuntary Re Reorganization of Pacifica by Filing a Superior Court Action to Dissolve Pacifica. Drafted by Bill Campisi as a tactic to basically get the PNB to cry uncle and enable K KPFA to capture the KPFA license with a KPFA LSB 501c3 to be formed by another proposal approved at that same time, that same meeting. The latter is the KPFA Foundation by a different name. Local control and yeah, local control. And then there is the bankruptcy issue that started rearing its head in the middle of 2017 with the Empire State Realty Trust summary judgment. That has been another vehicle to try to obtain local control when other options for paying what Pacifica owes ESRT were and still are possible. It's not been, it's, it's close to being dissolved or completed. All the, bank, all the bankruptcy fear-mongering with the former IED using his bully puppet to spur it along gets in the way of working out other payment options. And hopefully, this will not sabotage that effort completely. It also appears as though the bankruptcy strategy is backfiring. Actually, it was the CFO who first introduced the idea of bankruptcy during his first tenure, which began in January 2016. And although some have credited him with getting the 2014 audit complete, he resigned in mid-September 2016, and that audit was completed in December 2016. Most of the audit schedules for the 2015 audit were done by national accounting staff before he was rehired in March 2017. What's his name? Sam Agarwal. And as far as I understand, the 2016 audit has not been completed yet. I think, I don't even, I think it's, I thought it was almost completed, but, but I read something that it's not, it's just getting started or something. Anyway, I assume that is because the CFO chose to make working on bankruptcy documents a priority over getting the audits complete. Also note that the crisis group co-founders and purported champions of fair elections, Susan De Silva and Carol Spooner, were both just appointed to the LSB, one in January and one just yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And with the former now being the LSB chair and the latter LSB treasurer. Okay, which, which brings me to the 2016 recount. At the time, I was serving as PNB secretary and per the bylaws, I was mailed the ballots at the national office. Two CD disks were included and while looking for the files with the electronic ballots, I discovered that most write-in candidates had not been included in the counts. And as a result, the runners-up lists on the election website were incomplete. In addition, the true ballot vendor never supplied any runners-up lists. The NES had extrapolated, did I say that? National Election Supervisor, had extrapolated them from true ballots results and posted them to her elections website. For the KPFT staff election, she omitted one of the certified candidates as a runner-up, an oversight, and listed three staff members as runners-up to the WPFW listener election, as she had not vetted these write-ins on, on their membership class eligibility. She only listed six runners-up for, for the KPFA listener election when there were numerous write-ins that I had, I'm sorry, that had not been included. 
I brought this to the attention of the PNB, and on December 20, uh, 13th, 2016, the PNB voted for the interim executive director, Lydia Brazan at the time, to direct the NES to arrange for a recount of all the ballots to correct the runners-up lists by including all the unique write-in candidates disaggregated instead of lumping them all together, as True Ballot had done. At the December 17, 2016 LSB meeting, KPFA, the crisis group supermajority arrogantly repudiated the PNB and censured me for this motion. The PNB deemed that motion null and void and uh, shortly afterwards. Terry Goodman, a longtime Pacifican, former PNB director and with expertise in Choice Plus Pro, offered to take on the project as teller gratis and issued a recount report on July 22nd, 2017 that was shared with all the LSBs. He listed the NES's certified results side by side with the recount results. In addition to the six runners up for the KPFA listeners election, the NES had listed, the recount showed 20 more and five additional staff runners up to the three the NES had listed for KPFA. At the November, the November 2017 KPFA LSB meeting, the crisis group supermajority voted to reject using the recount results to replace vacant delegate seats. This set the groundwork for them to return to a self-selecting board by prematurely filling vacancies by appointment, which the bylaws allow when a runners-up list is exhausted. All this leads up to the overt machinations, maneuvers, and scheming that happened on January 6th, this past January 6th, and to this day, starting with the crisis group supermajority, including Susan Da Silva in the single transferable voting, or STV, listener director's election nominations list due by December 31st, when she was not a current delegate as the bylaws require of nominees. Note that the intent of the drafters of the Pacifica bylaws for using STV elections for listener directors, I'm sorry, uh, instead of three, you know, using STV instead of three instant runoff voting elections, IRV, that's majority wins was to force a form of proportional representation on the PNB from among the eligible delegates at the station, at each station. Using STV in the delegates' elections serves the same purpose. But back to the scheming. What followed was that they bypassed the PNB authorized recount results to seat Susan De Silva as a delegate replacement on January 6th. Then, during the closed session, after I objected to her being a candidate because she didn't qualify, they plotted secretly from the public a maneuver to get Susan on the PNB by hook or by crook, in which a placeholder candidate would run and win and then resign to be followed by an IRV majority election in which Susan, of course, would win. They claimed no one objected, but the scheming discussion had not been part of any motion. It was all an informal discussion. They implemented their, I was there. They implemented their scheme by first holding the S STV election in which three of the four candidates were pro-bankruptcy. Within six seconds of the announcement of the results, Bill Campisi resigned from the PNB, which he hadn't been seated on yet. A second later, literally, they held the IRV director replacement election that Susan was still unqualified to run in, an election that she ostensibly won 
but an election that was invalid because it only applies to seated directors. Then, after the PNB voted, I'm sorry, then, then after that, the PNB voided both the process of the KPFA LSB, uh, I'm sorry, they voided the process the KPFA LSB used to seat Susan De Silva as a delegate, the replacement process, and the process KPFA delegates used to elect her as one of the three listener directors. Given that one of the three directors elect had withdrawn, the PNB deemed Tom Voorhees as the third listener director from KPFA, director elect, because he had come in fourth place in the STV election. Not liking the PNB decision, Bill Cambisi filed a TRO, temporary restraining order, against Pacifica, in which he included his story of what had happened and made up a bunch of things to get the court to repudiate the decision of the PNB, basically asking the judge to deem Susan De Silva as the proper holder of the director seat, amend the bylaws, and ratify the scheming. Then, I mean, that's my, how I interpret. Uh, Makes sense. <laughs> then after Mr. Campisi admitted that Susan was indeed not qualified to run in the first place, Another IRV director replacement election was held in which Aki Tanaka was the winner. Mr. Campisi then amended his TRO, asking the court to order Mr. Tanaka to be the proper holder of that controversial director seat. The Pacifica defense lawyer filed opposition, opposition papers on Friday that included a declaration by me which contains a detailed chronology with documentation. The next hearing in the court case is on March 6th. The case number is RG18890224. The LSB with its crisis group supermajority has gotten away with so much. Things have gotten out of hand and the only check on them is the PNB. I hope the court puts them in their place because they continue to meddle in crucial matters that take away resources that are needed to save Pacifica. <laughs>